welcome to our HIPAA lawsuits a de facto right of individuals uh, to bring an action webinar. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lions Publishing. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Today's uh, uh, object, uh, agenda is going to be as follows. We're going to cover the learning objectives, uh, a little bit of background, and then dive into uh, HIPAA lawsuits of various kinds. Um, Lawsuits that can be brought by HHS and state attorney generals, uh, class action lawsuits that uh, everyone's read about in the press, some recent um, actions by individuals, and uh, maybe a little bit of discussion as to how all of these may intersect, and then where do we go from here. Uh, then obviously we're going to uh, do formal Q&A, but we're going to take questions as we go along. Um, there's a lot less content that is going to be thrown at you in this um, webinar. It's going to be hopefully mostly um, conversations and questions that we can get into. So um, the learning objectives, we want to provide a practical understanding of the types of HIPAA lawsuits covered by the press. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you have been reading about various lawsuits in Connecticut, in Indiana, and so forth. Um, so we'll talk about the categories of those lawsuits. We're really going to focus on negligence law 101 because this is the um, this is the cause of action that was used in the Walgreens case that we're going to talk about quite a bit, where there was a 1.4 four million dollar judgment against Walgreens um, and why that um, judgment came about, why and how that judgment came about uh, and, and, and why that may be actually be a game changer if other courts um, tend to rule in the same way. Um, and then we're going to talk about a concept of liability versus compliance. Um, and clearly, by the way this is presented here, they're not one and the same thing. And I think as a practical matter, uh, given the challenges that a lot of organizations have uh, had in, in trying to comply with HIPAA high tech, it may be prudent to start thinking in terms of liability versus compliance and what, what the trade-offs are and what you can do to reduce um, liability in particular, perhaps while at the same time not being even mostly in compliance. So uh, what we want to do is provide stakeholders with, this, with a sense of how lawsuits should be viewed and the potential liability with saying uh, the kind of the premise here is that you're going to see a lot more lawsuits. Uh, we're going to talk about reasons why you're going to see them um, and and you know, where they may be coming from, okay, uh, and why you will likely see more individuals bringing lawsuits um, as opposed to class action lawsuits. And, uh, you know, obviously HHS and, and state attorney generals can bring lawsuits uh, under HIPAA, and, and we're going to cover why individuals can't and what in, individuals are now turning to. Uh, so that they can bring suit. So a little bit of background, this is our three-legged stool, and this is the areas where uh, liability is likely to come from, some violation of the privacy rule, violation of the security rule, or violation of the breach notification rule. Right? That's at 100,000 feet where the liability lies, is, is some violation of one of these three rules. And what can HHS and state attorney generals do? Well, I think most of you know, um, and if you don't, um, you should, that HIPAA, either under high tech or prior to high tech, has never provided a private right of action. Now, that's to individuals. That's legal ease to say that an individual or a class of individuals cannot bring cannot bring um, 
a lawsuit under HIPAA, okay? Because HIPAA doesn't give them that right, right? What HIPAA does is it gives the right to uh, HHS and state attorney generals to bring a HIPAA action, okay? And so what is it that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about in the next couple of slides, what is it that individuals can do under HIPAA, but the question then becomes, well, what about the Walgreens case? How, how, you know, how do we get this, you know, $1.4 million judgment against Walgreens that was brought by an individual? How, how, how does that happen? Okay, so before we talk about that, though, we're going to talk about what individuals can do under HIPAA. And under HIPAA is really kind of a term of art, right? Under what under HIPAA means under what the HIPAA um, laws allow, okay? And under HIPAA, only two things an individual can do, and we're talking, you know, an individual patient for the most part. It's going to be a patient. File a complaint with HHS and or file a complaint with your state attorney general. That's it. That's all that individuals can do under HIPAA. Now, I'm just going to um, just encourage conversation. I'm just going to ask Martin, are there, are there any questions out there now I mean, this early on in the presentation? There are no questions, but I, I would make an announcement that the slides will be available uh, later. Um, for those okay. who want them to attend these. Now, there's been numerous class actions that have been brought. Uh, and these class actions are generally brought not under HIPAA. They're generally brought under two theories. Uh, some state breach law, a California breach law, um, or negligence. So then when you hear class actions, it's really just a, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of individuals. Uh, normally happens after a major breach. And because HIPAA doesn't give indiv individuals, one or more, a private right of action, then the plaintiff's bar, plaintiff's attorneys have to use other uh, ways to try to bring these actions, okay, and uh, class actions uh, have not met with a tremendous amount of success, and we're going to talk why they haven't met with a tremendous amount of success, but things could be changing, okay, and that's, that's kind of the gist of this particular um, webinar. So if an individual wants to bring an action, obviously we've already covered the fact that uh, an individual can't bring an action under HIPAA. You can't sue under HIPAA for some violation of one of your HIPAA rights or some you know, misuse of your PHI. Right? Your options are to complain to HHS. And yes, if, if your complaint to HHS shows willful neglect on its face, then HHS is mandated to investigate. What would be an example of that? Well, you know, you had three or four years ago, you had Signet get fined $4.3 million by HHS because they refused to provide PHI to patients as the privacy rule requires. And, you know, as many of you know, more of you are going to start to know because more and more patients start um, are going to start requesting uh, PHI that the privacy rule says you have to provide that PHI within a certain period of time. It's 30 days. And if you don't provide in that certain period of time, you have to provide in writing when you will provide it. And so there's certain due process requirements. So if HHS got a complaint uh, like the Cigna complaints that some covered entity or business associate just wasn't refusing to provide their PHI or, you know, providing PHI um, in a time frame, you know, of their choosing, then 
that probably would be an example of a complaint that on its face shows willful, willful neglect and uh, HHS would be forced to investigate, but that's different. That's still different than an individual bringing a lawsuit. Still, it's HHS. Okay, so individuals, just like classes of individuals, are going to bring uh, suits under two theories. Some usually, there are clever lawyers out there that could find more under state breach law or under negligence. Okay, and negligence really is what we're going to focus on today. So we're going to cover negligence 101 and I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that most of you out there are non-lawyers, so negligence is a state law cause of action, and obviously, you know, it, negligence is uh, what individuals use to sue providers for malpractice, to sue lawyers for malpractice, to sue for personal injury. I mean, negligence is just a broad area of the law that you use for many, many things. And there are four elements that a plaintiff has to prove in order to prove negligence. And the reason that we're talking about negligence is negligence is at the heart of some of these new holdings by, by courts recently. Was it the heart at the Walgreens case? So it behooves uh, all of us to better understand the basics here. Uh, so there are four elements that have to be proved in order for a plaintiff to prevail under a negligence theory. Duty, a breach of that duty, causation, and what that means is that the breach of the duty caused the individual some harm, okay, and, in, and harm in case of a personal injury, an accident, you know, that, you know, that harm is pretty clear. Harm in the case of some of these class actions that uh, courts have refused to recognize harm because they, they've refused to recognize that having to deal with potential identity theft wasn't a um, recognized harm, and we'll talk more about that. But And so you have duty, breach, causation, and you have damages. It has to result in some damages that the court will recognize. Those are the four factors in any negligence lawsuit. Okay, and it stands to reason that all four elements must be satisfied in order for the plaintiff to win. So the plaintiff is going to have to prove duty, breach, causation, and damages. Now let's just talk about duty. In, in the case of a HIPAA lawsuit, you know, the question is, is there a legal duty for a covered entity or a business associate to protect the patient's PHI? And the answer to that is clearly yes, because HIPAA, as a federal statute and federal regulations, clearly establishes that duty that a cover entity or business associate has the legal duty to protect patients PHI. So that's, that's readily established. Okay. Then the next question is breach. Did the covered entity or the business associate, have they breached what's called the standard of care that pertains to the duty? Okay. And as we're going to see, what many courts have held, not just recently, but you know, as early as 2007, what many courts have held is that HIPAA can be used as the standard of care to see if the duty was breached. Okay, so that's so HIPAA is really intertwined, inextricably intertwined with the first two elements here, duty and breach. And we're going to talk more about how HIPAA plays with those first two elements. Okay, so Martin, any, any questions at this point? Yes. Um, 
since the individual has the rights and the violation can really hurt the individual, not the government per se, how could we as private citizens change the HIPAA regulations to provide individual actions? Well, you know, the only way the only way that private individuals could affect a change in the law is to try to, you know, lobby Congress to change the law. And they would have to change HIPAA to allow for a private right of action. That I mean that's that's the formal process. Um but I gotta tell you I don't I don't, I don't see that happening. Okay. It's it's that's really a that's really a long shot, despite the fact that, you know, the whole e-patient movement, the whole empowered patient movement is, is gathering steam, the fact that millions of baby boomers are going to retire. Um, but as we're going to talk about today, there are ways around that. So that's the whole, that's the title of this, um, that's the title of this webinar is that there is a de facto uh, not de jure, de jure would be by law, there is a de facto right of action, and that right of action that we're going to talk about today is negligence. That's one, okay? And that's always been there. It's just that it's being used more often, and courts are more willing to entertain certain arguments than they have been in the past. Any other questions along those lines? No, that's the only question we have so far. Okay, so the standard of care, uh, as discussed, is inextricably intertwined with the first two elements, duty and breach. And the standard of care, for example, for malpractice would be, did the doctor or the healthcare clinician perform in the way that other professionals similarly situated would have performed? That would be the standard of care for, you know, malpractice. Okay, there's a standard of care for uh, a driver. Did the driver, was the driver driving in a way that other similarly situated drivers with using reasonable care, you know, would be driving, not speeding, etc. That would be the standard of care for a driver that may have caused a personal injury. So there's various standards of care. There's not just one. Now, the standard of care represents the measure of the duty owed. So let's talk specifically because you can kind of get lost in these abstractions that the standard of care is um, the measure of the duty owed. What does that mean? Well, in the case of HIPAA, if HIPAA is used as the standard of care, okay, that means that that that's the duty that is owed to the individual. In other words, complying with the HIPAA regulations is the scope of the duty that's owed to the individual. That's the standard of care. And remember, we're talking about a negligence lawsuit that has always been around, has never been preempted by HIPAA. It's just being used more and more. Okay? And so it's the measure of the duty owed, and it's also the standard by which a breach is established. So you breached your duty if you did not comply with the standard of care. So in other words, if you have met the HIPAA regulations, if you have dotted your I's and crossed your T's, you know, then you can make an argument or your, your attorney can make a good faith argument on your behalf that the, that the duty owed, in fact, wasn't breached. And if it wasn't breached, then the, then the plaintiff can't win. Okay, now, we all know the state of many, many hundreds of thousands of HIPAA compliance initiatives are nowhere near where they should be. So, you know, just from an anecdotal perspective, you're probably not going to have a hard time if you're an individual um, filing a claim showing perhaps that the duty was breached. For example, somebody stole a laptop with a bunch of PHI. 
and you know the, the plaintiffs now either individually or as a class want to bring suit you know did you breach the standard of care well that's an argument that's going to be had yes yes uh, encryption is not mandated but is what you did reasonable and appropriate under the circumstances etc cetera, etc cetera. so now when we talk about breach here we're really talking about breach in a very specific way that has to do with negligence doctrine okay we're talking about the element of breach duty breach causation damages we're not talking about a breach of PHI we're just talking about breach as as it refers to negligence and what it means is another way you can think about it is breach means a failure to satisfy the duty you had a duty here was the standard of the care by which the duty was to be judged the HIPAA regulations and you fail to satisfy that duty okay that's that's how the standard of care uh, is used so lots of courts not hundreds but going back to 2007 prior to the High Tech Act have held that HIPAA can be used as the standard of care in PHI negligence actions okay that's not really a um, something that's really disputed you know what I mean there's many many courts that have held that the Connecticut Supreme Court has recently held that the court in the Walgreens case has recently held that I, I, I think you're gonna see a lot more courts hold that HIPAA is the standard of care when it comes to PHI so I know we've been covering some kind of negligence abstractions are there any questions that are popping up here not yet I, uh, it, nothing uh, no okay so lots of courts have recently held um, and as far back as 2007 but recently the, the Connecticut Supreme Court in this particular case that you can look up Emily Byrne versus Avery Center for Obstetrics and Gynecology that HIPAA could be used as the standard of care for a negligence action okay what about the Walgreens case well, in the case of Walgreens let me just give you some background facts apparently a pharmacist at Walgreens had a boyfriend who had an ex that the pharmacist I believe it was a female pharmacist started investigating the meds that the ex was using okay by using the system that she used every day day in and day out in they you know were looking at records the pharmacist the new girlfriend was looking at records that uh, she arguably shouldn't have been looking at okay and the ex found out about it and brings a lawsuit under negligence okay and in this case as well HIPAA was used as a standard of care in Walgreens okay but that wasn't the big deal of the Walgreens case and HIPAA being used as the standard of care is not really the big deal in these negligence cases okay so if that wasn't the big deal if the fact that using HIPAA as the standard of care for negligence action wasn't the big deal in the Walgreens case then what was the big deal and it turns out that what was the big deal is this fancy Greek word term respondeat the at superior superior which means essentially let the master pay let the master pay for his or her servants bad acts okay and it's a well-established legal doctrine it applies in rare cases it doesn't apply in 
in other cases, and it usually doesn't apply when a particular employee does an intentional wrongful act. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's say you have, um, you know, you, you, you run, you run in a Walgreens, uh, Walgreens pharmacy and some customer is complaining to the manager and they get into a heated discussion and the manager you know punches the guy in the face well that's an intentional assault on the part of the manager and the manager clearly can be arrested and held liable for that wrongful act but in general because it's an intentional wrongful act that Walgreens would argue it had no control over, uh, many times Walgreens may not be held accountable for that wrongful act. Okay, it may not have to pay for the wrongful acts of its servants. And obviously, this is using Latin terms, so it, it, it's it, it's using master and servant. But you 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 get the picture. It's an employer. Uh, and an employee. Now, just like almost everything else under the law, there are, there are exceptions. There are exceptions if, for example, Walgreens created the kind of atmosphere that tolerated violence within its stores and tolerated managers punching customers in the face. Now, I mean, clearly, Walgreens and any other reputable retailer is not, you know, in most cases going to be found guilty of creating that kind of environment. But so there are exceptions that where, where you know that an employer can be held liable for a wrongful act. So this was the issue, though, in the Walgreens case. The issue was that this 1.4 million point 1.44 million dollar judgment was not only against the individual pharmacists for snooping, for performing a wrongful act, it was levied against Walgreens directly. Okay? And not only was it levied against Walgreens directly, respondeat superior, let the master pay, is often something that courts decide as a matter of law. And what that means is that the judges decide. Something is decided as a matter of law. It's not a factual issue that goes to the jury. The judge decides that. Okay? And in the appeals court, Walgreens appealed and said that in this particular case, the judge should have never have left the issue of respondeat superior to go to the jury. It should have been something that the judge decided as a matter of law, and you can imagine why Walgreens would prefer judges to decide that as a matter of law, because they understand the law, you know, purportedly when it applies, it doesn't apply. And in, in this particular case, the appeals court agreed with the trial court and said no. There were some factual issues that allowed it allowed this issue that's normally decided as a matter of law to go to the jury. And what those factual issues were in summary was um, that the pharmacist was not doing anything out of the ordinary. She didn't punch a customer. The pharmacist who was snooping on the X was, was using the systems that she normally used on a daily basis and really wasn't doing anything outside of the scope of her employment. Uh, now, it could be, you know, the, 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 it, obviously in this particular case, um, Walgreens lawyers probably argued that it was outside of the scope of the employment because she was snooping where she shouldn't have been snooping. But that's not how this case was decided. It was decided that she was using the systems that are regularly used. Now, you can imagine the potential import if you have a nurse snooping around because, you know, Bruce Springsteen has been admitted, and she's snooping around the EHR system, well, that's a system she uses on a regular basis. But 
Is she caring for Bruce Springsteen? No. She's in the emergency room, and Springsteen's like got a whatever, you know, and he's not even, not her patient, nowhere to be found. I, I, I mean, it, it, it just this fact pattern is sort of a, not a good fact pattern for uh, employers. Okay, I'm going to pause again and ask, are there any, any questions here? Yes, we have two. Um, one is about a situation when a patient had a wrong diagnosis for over a year. What does HIPAA do then? Well, wrong diagnosis probably doesn't have anything directly to do with HIPAA or PHI. A wrong diagnosis would likely be a, a, a negligence action, but it probably would be a malpractice negligence action. Okay? So the, the individual would have to prove duty, breach, causation, damage, but the standard of care would be, you know, did this provider uphold the professionalism and know what he was or she was supposed to know and yada, 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 right? So it probably would be a malpractice-based negligence case. And it wouldn't come under HIPAA. The second question is, what if any actions could have been taken to limit the liability of the covered entity, in this case, Walgreens? Yeah, I mean, those are facts that, that, that you know, in this particular case probably were, you know, facts that maybe helped the jury decide against Walgreens. Maybe there were, maybe there could have been other facts or other steps that Walgreens took that would have mitigated that and would have helped. Uh, I, I think we have one kind of fact pattern here, so a fact pattern really doesn't, really doesn't make a, a, a trend, you know, but the explosive nature of this decision was the fact not that HIPAA was used as a standard of care, but that Walgreens had an answer for the wrongful action of an employee. That, that's the real takeaway from a legal perspective, because that has widespread implications vis-a-vis -vis HIPAA lawsuits. Okay, And just to put this in the right context, we talk about, now we can talk about an individual patient being angry about something. They didn't get their PHI in time or they didn't get their notice of privacy practices and, you know, for whatever reason they suffered some damages or at least they allege that they suffered some damages. Now, once somebody alleges, then the, the covered entity's got almost no choice but to defend the action and start paying money to lawyers to defend the action or lose by default. So you, you actually have <laughs> You know, millions of patients may be opening up to the, opening their eyes to, oh, okay, I know I can't bring a suit under HIPAA, but I now understand that I can bring a negligence suit. And, you know, the plaintiff's lawyers being what the plaintiff's lawyers are and what they do, if they feel like they can prevail and get damages and money, they'll be willing to bring those suits. Now, there's still some barriers, and we're going to talk about those, uh, but that's, that, that's where the explosion of suits may come from as, as individual patients become better educated that, that they've had this de facto right of a private action all along. They just didn't know about it. Okay. Um, I have a few more questions coming up now. Why would the appeals court consider that the pharmacist not doing anything wrong when she had no direct reason to look at the boyfriend's or the girlfriend's PHI? No, I don't think it, I don't think the appeals court um, or the jury, you know, um, held that the that that the pharmacist did, the pharmacist didn't do anything wrong. It just held that the pharmacist and Walgreens did something wrong, okay? And then, and then it can, it can um, levy the judgment against the party that's got the deep pockets, which in this case is Walgreens. So you, you get a judgment against both defendants, right? The lawyers are going to sue the pharmacists. They sued Walgreens. You get a judgment. The way it works, it's joint and several liability, which is just a fancy way of saying, Everybody pays. 
we don't care if you're the plaintiff. Walgreens, you're on the hook for the entire 1.44 million, and the patient, you're on the hook for the entire 1.44 million. I mean, you can't get both. You're not going to get 2.888, but Walgreens can't say, oh, no, it's the patient's fault, and they should pay for 99% of it. No, it's joint and several liability. You know, uh, Walgreens has to come up with the 1.44 in this particular case because they're, they're the deep pocket. And, yeah, they could sue the pharmacist and try to get some money out of the pharmacist, but the pharmacist would declare bankruptcy, right? The, pharmacy, the pharmacist is not going to have the money to pay that kind of judgment. Okay, if HIPAA is emerging as a standard of care in private lawsuits, it's a BAA that includes more stringent requirements than those required by HIPAA, create an even higher standard, and here is the for instance, if a covered entity requires its business associates to meet NIST guidelines and the covered entity doesn't itself meet NIST guidelines, could that be used to show that the CE was aware of the potential and didn't act? Well, you know, it, 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 both the CE and the BA could be held liable. You could have a you could have a negligence um, suit against a BA under HIPAA, okay, and uh, and the business associate agreement is yes, it's a specialized agreement between two private parties. It has to have certain language as per the statute and the regulations, but beyond that. It's just a contract between two private parties. And whatever those two private parties agree to, as long as it's not unconscionable or illegal, becomes binding on those two parties. Now, the contract, though, and what's binding between those two entities doesn't really um, establish the standard of care. Okay, The standard of care for a negligence action against a covered entity or a business associate would be, if it's PHI related, you know, would be HIPAA. I mean, that's what the plaintiff's lawyers are going to argue, it's HIPAA. So if the BA violated the HIPAA regulations and didn't do what they were supposed to do, um, then, you know, then they could be held liable under a negligence theory. Okay. What if Walgreens had proof that it had trained its pharmacy employees to only use the system for patients they were filling prescriptions for and that looking at other records is a breach of HIPAA? Yeah, that would have been a good argument. That would have been a good argument in, uh, in favor of um, Walgreens. But would, have, would it have prevailed? I assume. I assume that... that um, uh, Walgreens had trained the, its pharmacists, but maybe it hadn't. I mean, maybe it hadn't, or maybe it had five years ago or seven years ago under the old HIPAA and hadn't retrained the pharmacists under the new HIPAA. You know, I don't know. We don't know without reading the record what kind of mitigating facts um, that um, Walgreens may have argued, but it apparently, in the summaries, it the court and the jury um, you know, kind of held that it was because the pharmacist was using the same systems that she normally would use. I'm not saying that that's the greatest argument, uh, but it prevailed here. It worked here. And, you know, the question is, you know, is it going to work anywhere else? Now, one, one case is not a trend, but clearly uh, the, what I wanted to get across here is, is that it wasn't, that the fact that HIPAA was used as a standard of care, it was this, let, let the master pay for the bad actions of the servant. Let the master Walgreens pay for the bad action of um, the pharmacist, A, and B, that that determination in this particular case was not made by the court as a matter of law. The court actually passed that question on to the jury, and the appeals court affirmed it and said it was okay. 
to pass that on to the jury. Okay, so you have, I believe this was in, in, in Indiana, you have at least one state appeals court that said, okay, no, that's good, that's fine. You can do that. You can let the jury decide whether or not the master should pay. Now, you know, a jury deciding that, you know, it, 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 juries are juries generally do a good job, right? That's that's a principal reason why our jurisprudence, uh, American jurisprudence, works so well. I mean, you, you can argue about, you know, that sometimes it doesn't work, but look, day in and day out, juries make pretty good decisions, and and, and that's why it works. In this particular case, that's the decision that the jury made, and and in part, that's the potential scary things for employers because. You know, juries may be more inclined to favor the plaintiff, right? Not always, but you know. So the theory goes. Any, any, any more questions here? Yes. If a CE has policies in place, and I'm assuming we're still on the same subject regarding the the pharmacy tech annual education and random auditing auditing in place, how can the CE be held liable for one employee's actions when the CA has thousands of employees? <laughs> that's, that's the nature of what, that's why we're talking about this particular case, because that's exactly what happened here. And, and an appeals court upheld it. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, at, let, let me give you just a practical education in the law in, because even even a lot of law students and lawyers are, are 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 misinformed really because at the end of the day the law is nothing more than what a court says that it is okay as a practical matter it's what a court says that it is until some other court higher court you know reverses it that's the law that's the law of the case, that's what applies. That's what this particular appeals court upheld, that under these facts, and you can imagine that Walgreens had the best lawyers money could buy, and that they made every argument they could make under the sun, uh, presumably. And, you know, that didn't work in this particular case. Now, we don't know how well they were trained, and I, and I agree. I'm not arguing. I agree to the fact, you know, with, with the fact that to the, to the degree that you are compliant with HIPAA, have trained your employees, you know, have dotted your I's and crossed your T's, you're making an argument that that duty wasn't breached because you, 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 you met the duty by complying with the rules, right? But just in this particular case, that was... That was not enough, apparently. But we don't really know the facts that uh, Walgreens argued with respect to the standard of care. Okay. Uh, what would your recommendations be for a privacy officer to take or focus on in attempts to decrease, decrease the liability under respondent superior for established daily operational practices, such as employees are required to participate in compliance training, security, and confidential practices. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, that, that's that's obviously a great question, right? And some of it is going to be, some of it is going to be based on enhanced training. Did this pharmacist actually get trained? That you know, yes. Um, Okay, so let's go back to the Bruce Springsteen. You know, why was this particular nurse in the emergency room allowed to access records for patients that she wasn't treating? Yes, she's got access to the HR system, but, you know, the argument might be made that under roles and responsibilities, that should be limited, right? So one of the things you should definitely uh, look at is limiting um, access the EHR systems on uh, on a need to know basis, not have these loose policies that anybody with a login ID and a password can go in there and see everything. Correct? And yes, in some small practices that's warranted because the nurse is the nurse for all. Uh, but maybe, you know, um, where there's two or three nurses and there's serving two or three doctors, that's not the case. So these are the kinds of things that you have to look at that may be able to mitigate 
this, this you know this kind of action now other other wrongful acts like not like not um, providing PHI uh, in a timely way it, you know it's it, that's just going to be that that the burden is going to be on the covered entity there's just no way that 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 kind of intentional wrongdoing is going to um, you know fall just on the individual that refused to do it because they're you know they're uh, ultimately the covered entity is going to be held responsible for certain basic things like that now there are gray areas I suppose if no one else knew about it blah 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 but good luck really trying to make that case you know so it, it, there are a lot of things now especially in this whole area of the patient's bill of rights where they have rights to get their PHI with cert within certain days they have rights to amend their PHI and, and they're becoming more educated about them that where in the past almost no small practices or even big practices or hospitals worried about an individual making a complaint about PHI because there was no private right of action for the individual that you know the, they were just kind of SOL you know and I I would get calls all the time I'm saying you know you can't really bring an action and I don't practice personal injury so you know that that uh, and and I wouldn't practice it now but I might say you know hey if it's egregious enough you might be able to find a personal injury lawyer that would bring a negligence action so uh, this is just trying to make you aware that these things are out there and are, and are likely to to grow so um, I've moved on Martin but are there any other questions no we're all good right now okay so respond to superior let the master pay that's what that's what made Walgreens have to pay a 1.4 million dollar judgment okay I believe the, the judgment was definitely against the pharmacies and Walgreens but it's obviously that Walgreens had to eat it so where where are we going from here well you know it's really it's really too early to tell there's no you know one judgment like this doesn't make a trend and one of the things I, I, I wanted to point out just for lay people not to be confused that that if you read that HIPAA is used as a standard of care and that HIPAA is used as a standard of care in 20 more cases that doesn't necessarily mean that the plaintiff prevailed okay that's just the judge saying HIPAA can be the regulations can be used as a standard of care to figure out whether or not a breach occurred duty breach causation damages okay uh, but if you get more of these respondeat superior for wrongful acts of viewing PHI, then you might want to start paying more attention because then we may have a, a, a trend. Now, historically, large class action lawsuits have not been that successful for breach. Um, I think they've been mostly for breach because the, the because the judges have pushed back and said, you know what, you, yes, this might have modified, this might have uh, violated the California breach law, and but we you know we don't really recognize the damages here. You got to prove all four elements: duty, breach, causation, damages. And they're saying, you know, this this whole thing about. Um, identity you know future identity theft and the unknown of having to deal with that you know we don't really recognize that as a damage that we're going to allow here okay now recently in California I think this was a federal court that court broke with that consensus view and said no you know what we think this this kind of identity theft future damage we think that that's cognizable we're, we're going to allow that to proceed we're not going to allow you to win real early in the game just because you say there's no damages or the damages are really nebulous or okay now that's that's a break with the consensus and uh, with respect to damages okay now clearly in in the Walgreens case damages wasn't a problem you know there was some the ex got hurt because they her PHI was compromised and you know, you'd have to read the opinion, you get more into it, but historically damages have been a sticking point for these type of cases. And if you start seeing federal courts or state courts saying, you know, you know what, this whole cyber um, war thing is getting more press and 
this really is a pain and you got to go deal with this identity theft. You may have to spend hours and hours resolving that. And then we're going to start, you know, recognizing that as legitimate damages. That also becomes a game changer. Okay, and that also will encourage the plaintiff's bar to bring more of these kinds of suits. So this kind of a, you know, this is early warning. It's like these things are out there. They have been out there for a while. But the trend now, or pieces that could make up a trend, are going against covered entities where in the past they tended to favor covered entities and business associates. Okay, any questions here? Not at the moment. So let me talk a little bit about this concept of liability versus compliance. You, as a covered entity or a business associate, could potentially eliminate 95% of the liability despite being only 5% compliant. Now, by that I don't mean to say that this absolutely or directly applies to the Walgreens case. I just thought this was an appropriate time to have this conversation that liability and compliance are two different things. And here's what I mean. If you encrypt everything you can encrypt, all your PHI at rest, all your PHI in, in motion across the wire, if you dispose it according to the NIST protocols to make sure that you know the PHI is rendered uh, unusable and decipherable, etc. Okay, ninety-five percent of the liability today is really coming from the eight hundred pound gorilla of the High Tech Act, which is breach notification. The the um, chances are that you're going to get audited, and and I, I think most of you know that the HHS audits are starting back up in twenty fifteen. But the chances of anyone getting audited is just like the chances of someone getting audited by the IRS are really, really small. Okay, but if you encrypted everything you could encrypt, uh, and you know you hadn't trained your employees well, and you know, yes, if if there was an audit, you're going to get slapped on the wrist. But you didn't lose the PHI of thousands and thousands of patients, and that's where the big fines and the big um, damage to your reputation and the cost to notify those millions of patients, that's where it turns into millions of dollars of liability. Okay, So if you have a limited budget, you should focus on doing those things that are absolutely going to reduce your liability, even if they're not dramatically increasing your compliance. Now, it's a couple of things. Encrypt, encrypt, encrypt do a risk assessment even if it's not the best risk assessment in the world because if, HH, if HHS shows up they're going to want to see a risk assessment they've already said that but the perfect risk assessment is not the objective right it's like did you do one or did you just stick your head in the sand and say oh no it's too expensive blah 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 we're not going to do it okay there are ways now to do um, cost effective reasonable uh, yes not the best not the most rigorous but that's not the requirement, okay? And but you're encrypting everything, and you've taken major, major steps to reduce your liability. You're really helping yourself out, even though you know you may only be five percent compliant, okay? And there's two things that I always say: is encrypt, 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 and don't store any PHI on mobile devices. And what I mean by mobile devices, and I know that the industry. By and large, 90% ignores this, and that's why you see laptops being stolen all the time, phones being stolen all the time, and it's a really easy thing to fix is don't store PHI locally on laptops, PCs, phones, pads. Make all those mobile devices be access only, okay? And if you had to, for some reason, store PHI on a mobile device, on an exception basis, then encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Okay, and so given that the majority, even the biggest covered entities, have a hard time allocating enough resources to comply the way they should, 
I believe that covered entities and business associates are going to have to start taking a harder look at reducing their liability uh, as well as attempting to comply. Any, any questions here? No, we don't have any at this time. Okay, so I, I think, you know, I, I um, adequately explain that if you didn't understand it seems like you got it because there were no questions um, we're just gonna move quickly on here to the shameless plug I think most of you know that we sell educational products we get a subscription plan for 795 a year that covers all our products uh, including recently introduced audit preparation training module overview one for the security rule um, one for the privacy rule and one for breach notification rule are going to be coming out uh, hopefully in a month or a month and a half. These are all dealing with the HHS published audit protocol on a requirement by requirement basis. So one of the things, some of the questions earlier were, well, if you're doing everything that you should be, can you make an argument that you didn't breach? And yes, that's, a, that, I mean, I don't know, I can't tell you specifically you know, without digging more into the opinion why that didn't work in in the Walgreens case. But that, you know, if, if I'm your counsel, that's where I'm going to start and say that's where you make a good faith argument that you didn't breach because you complied. Uh, but I also know that most most covered entities and business associates are not complying the way they should. Many haven't done a risk assessment despite they know, despite the fact that they know they have to do a risk assessment. Many haven't retrained their employees, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, recently released, these these are uh, we released the audit preparation overview training uh, a couple of weeks ago. We re released the security rule audit preparation training uh, a couple of days ago. Anyone that's um, a subscriber of ours gets this as part of the subscription, and you can buy them standalone. And for example, the audit preparation overview training, a standalone is $229. The security rule audit preparation training standalone is $379. But if you got our subscription, you get these new products as part of the subscription along with the other 25 products that, that have come. So we like to think that we provide the recipe, not just the ingredients, and that we provide educational products you can start executing on day one. And if there's any other questions, we can, we can take some now. We don't have any more questions. Well, very good. Thanks for listening. It's been my pleasure being with you guys again today.